It's all over, but for the crying on everybody's pillow. Hi, I'm Brian Brake. This is Breaking Down Security. Miss Ble- Miss Berlin, Mr. Betcher's with us this week. Hello. Who are you making cry? Uh, the people who Everybody did not necessarily. Uh, Go ahead. People who didn't uh, participate, or when the. Uh, oh. I, I would say more participate. <laughs> if you if you failed to uh, participate, you're probably crying that you missed it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so our DerbyCon s- ticket CTF, which we actually expected to go until like this Friday, which is the 31st of August. Um, one of the people actually got all the flags like yesterday morning. <laughs> uh, so how many days is that? It started sa- Sunday? Did it start sun- Sunday, what? Sunday morning. Sunday. Yeah, Sunday morning. So it took him a little over, what, two and a half days to get all of them? So. Yeah. I guess that's not bad. I was thinking it was hard. That's not too bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Miss Berlin made some challenges. Uh, Mr. Betcher made some challenges. I made a couple of challenges. Tyler Hudag made some challenges. He's also going to be teaching at DerbyCon. uh, Reverse engineering and debugging stuff and malware detection stuff. Um, And Matt Domko made some challenges. And he was also our uh, IT admin and infrastructure guy. Of which uh, he did a good job of making challenges. <laughs> Aww. I, I, I'm so, I, I feel bad for him because I don't think uh, he expected, uh, we did not plan for capacity. Uh, we did not do capacity planning at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we, we stuck the CTF Broke machine. That cardinal rule. You're right. So we, we stuck, the, we stuck the, the, the beefy servers on a couple of Raspberry Pis and, uh, you know, five people t- brought it down, I think. So, um, <clears throat> and I think some IPs were getting blacklisted. So uh, there was a couple of times where uh, he had to bring down some of the servers that were actually had challenges on them. And I think he took those down. Um, the final straw, I guess we'd gotten all the flags and I was like, you know, we need to kill it because we've already got people who can't get back into stuff. And, uh, what was that about Monday? I, I realized that if people were actually getting blacklisted at when they were working on these challenges at work, they could conceivably blacklist their company's IP addresses, which would kind of be bad not being able to access there's AWS. a lot of stuff on Amazon. There's a few things. There's a few things on Amazon. <laughs> people might, you know, it, it's a small mom and pop, you know, cloud provider that, you know, some you know, people... do they, I, I wonder, do they block, uh, you know, AWS wide, like all the, all the buckets and all the locations, or is it just like, you can't now access this server? I don't know. I asked the question, how long they block the IP addresses and somebody put up the forever meme from the sandlot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, they, they do tell you when you're pen testing and you get permission from Amazon to pen test, you know, if there's certain specific instance types, you're not supposed to pen test those at all. Um, so, it, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll definitely uh, look into having a beefier server next year. Um, we'll, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 actually, <laughs> we'll actually pay for servers next year. Um, but, yeah, we appreciate Matt for, uh, for going above and beyond. The uh, scoreboard was great. I actually enjoyed it. You know, it was watching it and submitting the yeah. uh, the challenges. Yeah, my favorite part was I can't. I think it was the winner or second place or or somebody actually um, reversed the MD5 hashes for some of our flags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, was so the that, winner. That made me happy because like I I would just go to like an MD MD5 creator and and type in some words and that would be my flag. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it was, yeah. it was cool that he thought to reverse those. Yeah, I did some of the, the we, we had some false flags on Twitter. So there were, you know, and if you were listening to last week's show, you heard several Twitter accounts on there. Um, one of them was at Cascadia Sec, which is one that I set up a long time ago for my LLC that I have. Um, that's where the flag actually was. You know, we mentioned Slutty Carrot. We mentioned uh, all of the show's po- Twitter handles, and the and the flag description was Twitter handle you heard on the show, which probably was overly simple, but um, several people did find that one, thankfully. So I was re- I was worried more about that one than my own PCAP one that I created. So. Um, and everyone seemed to like Mr. Betcher's challenge. Is that right? Yeah. So maybe you could explain to us how you solved that one. Cause I couldn't even know where to begin. 
Well, <clears throat> I knew what I wanted to do. I just didn't know how to create the challenge. Uh -huh. So I'm a programmer. So I just wrote a program Easy. that actually takes the binary representation of each ASCII and knots it. Okay. So it changes ones to zeros and zeros to ones. So it's a okay. simple encoding. Um, and then I could do whatever I wanted. Um, so I just entered the number of bytes that I wanted to encode in a file. So if I wanted to create a file that's 500 bytes and then encode the first 200. Okay. Um, I got the idea from a piece of malware that I saw that was really fast and it would, it would encrypt your entire box in, I don't know, less than a minute, something like that wow. or 30 seconds. And so when I started looking into the files, it had only encrypted the first, you know, one K I think it was exactly one kilobyte of every file it would encrypt. Well, that makes so like, sense. Oh, that's pretty clever. You just, you just screw up the first part of it. Maybe it's really important stuff, but if, if you have a, um, a, a large data file, you can recover most of your data there. Right. But most people would look at that and say, oh, crap, it's, it's all encrypted. So that's where I got the idea from, from actual um, ransomware. Yeah. The first, yeah, the first 1K is what? File type, file headers, inode information, and then the, the actual contents of the file itself are after a certain amount. Now, obviously, if the file is less yeah. than 1K in size, you're going to encrypt the whole file. But um, right. for the larger Word files or PBTs or, you know, work type files, you could probably have opened up the, the encrypted files and, and pulled out necessary bits and then added them to like a skeleton PPT uh, file and, and maybe have recovered some of your data, I would imagine, right? Potentially. Yes. Um, for, for those kind of files, they're, um, they're binary files. So it would be pretty oh, hard. Right. But the, the file I created was a, a CSV and I made it out to be a CSV to give people a little bit of a hint, like, okay, there's commas in there. There's gotta be commas. Right. Right. And, um, so, so that's how I did it. I wrote a program and I, I quote, I'm using air quotes, encrypted it and then decrypted it by running the same program again on the first 200 bytes or whatever I had set mm -hmm. and it ended up working. So, so I created a, um, the real file and um, used the program on that. And that's how it worked. Cool. So you um, should have been able to, especially with the hint I gave on the last podcast, uh, look at the file in binary and and figure out, well, okay, wait a minute. They only encrypted the first so and so many characters and it looks like the rest is good. So right. with those hints, um, you should be able to figure out um, through trial and error what was going on. Right. So um, there wasn't anything special in the challenge.txt you gave me, right? It was just basically a setup like you need to be able to access this file. There was nothing special in that? Nothing special in the actual question. Okay. Right. Well, the reason I was I was asking was I could probably put a link to the passwords.supercrypto if people wanted to attempt to, you know, crack that outside of the CTF. Just, you know, for proof of concept, see how it works. On your own, just flip the bits and then open it back up. Yeah. yeah. I uh, tried to find a binary editor, you know, like a GUI. And uh, I couldn't find a good one. They're all hex editors. Right. So it's oh. not as easy to just read the hex and say, oh, it's, it's um, you know, a, a, an eight in hex is really whatever it is. Right. So, so Miss Berlin, how about you? Would um, you, you had challenges based on uh, the noble potato. <laughs> all of mine were pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are there uh, so you've got a couple of files here in the uh, the DerbyCon Challenge folder too? Um, are there any? Uh, can I put links to those on in the show notes as well? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. You you don't mind do, asking? Do you want me to like uh, tell people how to do them or? Well, that might be helpful. I mean, we just walked through some of Mister Mister Betcher's, so. Um, I can't remember which one is which. Oh. Uh. But I have, I think there, the first one. Yeah. Okay. I do know. 
So the first one, which is potato one, um, is a zip file. All right. So okay. it's, it doesn't say it's a zip file, but you have to like use the file command and, and figure out what type of file it is. Okay. So potato.file, the one you, yeah. okay. Potato.file. Yep. Okay. Yep. It's an actual zip file. So you can change the extension and it'll turn back into a zip that you can uh, uncompress. Okay. Um, and then you'll find like, it's like six or seven pictures of potatoes. <laughs> That's disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> and in one of, uh, in one of the potato pictures, uh, the flag is hidden in the metadata. Ah, okay. Yeah, or EXIF data. And then there's a taters.zip. Um, yep, taters.zip is a zip text file. Is it? A, does it say zip or is it just taters? It says taters.zip. Oh, it's not supposed to have a file extension. It was supposed to, you were supposed to be have to use... I, I kind of want to like compound it. Like if you learn something from the first uh, uh, challenge, you mm -hmm. would have to also use that on the next one. So yeah. I wanted people to have to use file on that as well. Yeah. Or it, it, you know what? I might've actually changed it. It might not actually be a zip file. It might just be a text file or something uh, like that. Okay. I can't re I can't remember. It was a while ago. All right. Um, but that one's really just this giant long text document. I searched for uh, file type. Uh, equals text on Google and then search for potatoes. Okay. So anything that I found that was a text file on potatoes, I put in one giant text file and the flag is in there. Um, but it's not uh, the correct format or whatever. So you have to like, you know, use regex or whatever to try and find an MD5 hash. Okay. Um, and then the third one is a PCAP file. And that is just on my uh, uh, lab network. I was just capturing packets. Uh, I think it was from a Cali box, maybe. Just doing random stuff and then like web browsing. And I browsed to uh, a potato website and put the flag in the HTTP um, URL. So right. you actually see the URL in the packet capture. Okay. Very nice. All right. Well, so they're all all fairly easy, um, but I I didn't want to make I I just always assume everybody else's challenges are going to be way harder than mine, uh, and I know some of the uh, simple stuff I've learned on some of my first CTFs that I had done. Right. And I wanted to incorporate some of that. That's nice. That's cool. Yeah, I did. I did two challenges. The Twitter one, of course, uh, which was fairly rudimentary. It was just, you know, I, I actually had that flag setting up since like, you know, first of July because I was like, well, that's the one I'm gonna, you know, be able to do. The other one I I did um, was was also a PCAP challenge. And, you know, it's one of those things that's I've gone to like SANS uh, net wars and whatever and, and, and went through those. And there were some level two challenges on like, you know, look through the PCAP and find the flag for this thing. And I was like, oh, well, I want to be able to do something like that, too. So, yeah, um, I, I started up um, like five VMs on my MacBook, all Alpine Linux, because they're really small footprint and resource not intensive. And I installed Netcat. And set up the, the the listener so that when people would, um, you know, when when somebody would run in map on it, they would get like brony poetry or something like that. So sometimes if you scrolled down through the the PCAP, you would find like you know brony poetry for My Little Pony stuff and uh, <laughs> and other things. So I had like each each VM had different ports, and each one pointed so that when it got tickled by in map or by somebody you know visiting it like i was you know somebody interrogating a network they would get a text some of the text file and on one of the vms i set up port 6666 which um you can go in and look at the pcap on that um if you look for port 6666 in the the 10 meg you know zipped down pcap file uh you can find the flag and that one that one was i i thought fairly easy but there were some people that didn't get that one either so i don't i don't know if maybe i made that one too hard um uh you know after i knew what to look for because i had done it back in july as well because i was overly you know overly preparing for this um it actually took me a few minutes to find my own flag and my own pcap 
Uh, <laughs> one of the things I found was easy was um, setting the length. If you set the length up on top, you know, it was only looking for certain things. So like the largest packet, I think, was some brony poetry or something like that. Um, don't ask me why I, love, I went to brony. I love that it's brony poetry. <laughs> It's some kind of brony fanfic or something. I don't know, but um, yeah, I, I you yeah. know. And if you scroll down through, eventually um, you you find port sixty six sixty six, but it's not um, it's not like one of the top fifteen or twenty twenty packets. So I actually had to do some searching for it. Um, uh, later on, I found out you could just search for flag or you know any any iteration of the word flag, and it would show you the 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 packets that it had in there but you had to follow okay. tcp stream to be able to actually re- reconstitute the the stream to be able to re- you know recreate the uh the flag itself so it wasn't like you could just click on a specific um a specific packet and get the answer so um i actually learned something about pcap that i didn't know before so that was cool um uh, next year, I'm already I'm already thinking about ideas on what to do. You know, some some vulnerable VMs or or something like that, just to you know learn various tools and stuff. So I'm I'm already starting to think about next year, which is I guess what a lot of CTF builders do. So um, yes, thank thank you, Mr. Betcher. I see that you're you're highlighting our winners. So um, our winner, of course, uh, on Twitter. If you want to follow him on Twitter, his uh, his hash his handle is. Uh, gig gig staggart s-t-a-g-g-a-r-t gig staggart uh the second one is actually one of our uh our slackers oh hi oh hi underscore ninja he's on uh, on our slack with us and the third one was sodak hib uh s-o-d-a-k-h-i-b and um so i gave i gave prizes to first second and third place so the winner of course got the DerbyCon ticket second place got a set of basic practice locks which i found out his 12 year old uh, daughter is going to love those and uh, a set of uh lock picks so those are already been uh, ordered from the tool website and are on their way and uh, sodak hib uh, also got a set of uh he just got a set of lock picks and some stickers that I've I emailed I mailed out this morning. I did a good job. I actually used the mail. So um, hopefully he doesn't live in Tennessee because they're illegal there. Stickers? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a recent ban. And it's just uh, yeah. yes, stickers only, with pictures only, of only lock assault. Picks. Only assault stickers. Assault are, stickers. Okay. Assault stickers are illegal and yeah. First straws and now stickers. Damn. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I don't believe he lives. In, I think he might live in Michigan, Minnesota, something like that. So. Um, with an M. Yeah. Uh, at, no, it is Minnesota because I almost had his entire mailing address before he supplied me with the email or the mail address. So that was cool. Um, thank you, Osin. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I was on Pipple, I was on Spokio, I was doing name check, I was doing all that stuff. I found out his town, I found out his name, I found out where he works, his wife's name, his children's names. I was like, okay, this is getting a little creepy, I just need an address. And I have his phone <laughs> number, and I was like, okay, I just need a freaking address. And then he replied back on Twitter, I was like, thank you, I didn't want to have to crawl up in this guy's, you know, uh, you know, life. life, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like a dog with the bone. Once you, I, I can't let it go. So, um, but yeah, I was, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see if we can get uh, Tyler maybe to do some blogging or do a blog on his challenges. They were way more complicated than ours. I think there were some, you know, debugging and stuff that he did. Uh, and, uh, we can actually get, uh, um, uh, Matt to uh, talk about his. Oh, you know what? I'm I'm letting I'm the most one of the most important people. Uh, Dave did a bunch of trivia. Dave Cybuck, our our moderator. Oh yeah, whole lot of trivia. Got got Dave, Mr. Kennedy involved, and the organizers of of Derby because all of his trivia was based on past 
derby cons like what was the the first keynote you know what what was in the lost and found what was the first prizes given out for uh events at that and a lot of people enjoyed that it was it was very enjoyable uh, a lot of people got to walk down memory lane however fuzzy it might have been uh during derby cons one two and three and all those so um yeah uh, dave did a fantastic job uh, getting all that information and wa- going through all of uh, iron geeks videos to find that information so that was that was fantastic so uh, bully for him. We're going to enjoy seeing him at uh, at DerbyCon this year. Oh, Both yeah. Daves, Dave Kennedy and Dave Cybuck. All right. So we've talked enough about our challenges. Um, <clears throat> we'll give a, a quick update on, on some of the DerbyCon stuff at the end, but we wanted to discuss a little bit about the... Um, topic we were supposed to talk about last week but we you know ended up not getting to it and that was uh, called windows event forwarding yes so i i have never used this uh it, it, it's obviously fairly self-defining it's kind of in the name what does it do right it's yeah, it, you know go ahead yeah, yeah all right <laughs> no if you want to, uh so i just recently set it up again um and you can actually uh, as as opposed to taking all of your endpoints or picking and choosing endpoints and um, you know installing an agent to forward like OSEC or NXLog or um, Graylog or whatever and using that to forward log somewhere, you can push out settings with the GPO uh, okay. into Windows and it will forward all of those endpoint logs to this Windows event collector. Nice. Um, and they'll just end up on that server, just like a regular windows event log, um, just in a different file. So it's nice. Um, it's a nice concept anyways. Uh, so you, you, you know, if you don't want to have to put another, uh, um, piece of software on all of your desktops or all of your servers or whatever. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Committee recognizes the fine gentleman in glasses. Do you still get people that say, Oh, I just can't, I can't have another agent on my machines because there's too much running on there already. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, how many, how many agents are too many and how many, what, what happens when we start having duplication like that? Well, if, if you haven't noticed pretty much everything that runs on windows is, is some sort of an agent, right? You have what, I don't know, a hundred services running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are all like agents, right? Right. So to speak. As long as it's not killing your your processing power and your memory and everything, I don't see why there's an issue. Well, right. I I can I can see a small issue now if you're running and we're going back to the aforementioned uh, Amazon. Uh, if you have a ton of stuff in your environment in Amazon, every cycle that you use on some agent is one less cycle you have to use on your development environment, on your application, on serving web page. That's money down the drain, exactly. And that's bandwidth down the drain, depending on, you know, because you do have to pay for the bandwidth that is being moved around in your Amazon environment. So if you, you know, if you're... I mean, I think it's it would be the same bandwidth either way, but it would definitely be less processing power and memory and stuff if you didn't have an additional agent. Sure. <clears throat> but so my question is, so you have like things like endpoint and endpoint security solutions, or if you're smart, you're using containers that don't have any kind of endpoint security solutions in them because, you know, they don't last long enough to be, you know, useful for infection purposes. Yeah. Um, so, and if you're in an Amazon environment, would you use something like windows event forwarding, or you know, go for the more robust system sim type solution. I guess it depends on what your end goal is, um, because uh, we were talking, you know, before we started recording that WEF uh, isn't always the best, just because it misses events sometimes. Okay. Um, or oh, it will okay. randomly stop working. I, I was going to be careful because I've heard that from several people and I didn't, I wasn't going to mention that on the podcast because it might just be that they screwed up. Maybe I don't know. 
unsubstantiated. Um, but you say that you've had this happen to you firsthand. Yeah. Like I, I, I set this up last week and I have, you know, my, uh, uh, uh VMware on my MacBook, and I had a domain controller, another server and two, two desktops. Right. And I'm like, Oh, that's a nice little, uh, you know, small little lab that I can do this testing with. And, you know, you're not wor- ha- you don't have to worry about any networking issues and, and nothing like that. You know, my MacBook can handle, you know, four VMs with, you know, just normal amount of memory, CPU, whatever. Right. And it was working, all working fantastic. And then like randomly it just would stop collecting events on an endpoint. Yeah, so I, didn't change any, I didn't change anything. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, pile on to the missing events thing. But while you guys were chatting back and forth amicably, I did do a search for Google missing events, Windows event forwarder. And uh-huh. there's a there's there's September 21st, 2017. Hello, I have a problem with some missing events on event source initiated subscription. Subscription was created on a standalone 2012 R2 box configured by GPO. Subscription works and security logs are collected from the client workstation. But after comparison of the local copy of logs, I see some small parts are missing. Two second range around 10 events. The event, event collector, I found uh, events missing related to the WinRM service. Uh, WS man uh, operation identity failed error code to da 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 da. Um, but all th- at this, all events keep fine. Missing events occurred hours ago. So, you know, people are trying to, you know, walk through setting up and adding port openings, TCP port 443. So it appears that, you know, this is a fairly widespread thing. So I would imagine. Are there any errors in the event? In the- Windows event forwarding log. Um, I don't. I don't see anything on that. Somebody just said hi, Mr. Oleg. Please check to make sure the dependency services and when event log is is started. Um, <clears throat> and then you can. Re- you know, they're asking you to repair the file system. Uh, this, uh, this must be some kind of robot or something asking about that. But um, <clears throat> so it seems to me maybe the Windows event forwarder is not good for high speed events. Maybe there's some things that are missing or. Um, you know, maybe it's not robust enough to be used in a like a largely enterprise environment. And it's more like a small business type of tool where you're not logging thousands and thousands of you know things a second. So yeah, and you, and and maybe if you're not, it, if you can afford that type of loss, right? In in logging, right? Some people can't. You know, some people are. You know, two seconds of logs could be, you know, the difference between an actual incident and not. Right. You know, right. Right. Plus if you're missing events and you need to, uh, well, a lawyer, if you're trying to (laughs) go to court, um, for some either breach or insider, uh, whatever theft and you're missing logs, the, um, defendant lawyer is going to eat you alive. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And for, for compliance, compliance, you're supposed to have them all. Well, how do so you know what is you, all? Well, what happens if you get an, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just depends. Well, right? no, I mean, oh, cause let's say you, ones. you tell the auditor, we have a robust, uh, logging regime. We don't log, you know, every time a file is changed or, you know, something that's innocuous. Mr. Betcher would be able to explain this better than I would. Yeah, well, but like, I mean, there's some uh, compliance standards or whatever, like all log in and log off events or anything like that. If you right. have an auditor come in and spot check and they're like, all right, I want to know, I want to see all <laughs> of the logging events on this device. I, I don't know that there's an auditor that is that picky that they're going to double check your SIM and the endpoint, but I guess the possibility is there. Right. Right. So, um, I, you know, I found a a blog post from, uh, Jessica Payne. She was, uh, she presented a session talking about windows event forwarder. She says that when she engages in incident response, they find that the customer often doesn't have centralized logging. They're not monitoring their endpoints, just DCs or member, not member servers. 
right. the spam logs with extra data. So that's, you know, over logging, uh, not logging key events, uh, logging rolls over too quickly. And with centralized logging, still missing data takes too long for admins to get reports. So that's, that's, that's fairly, you know, that's, that's a, that's a hot mess right there. I mean, it's hard because mm-hmm. when you're doing incident response, you need to have all that data. You need to have it as quickly as possible because time is of the essence in many cases. And in most IT environments, you're not getting that. So, um, would, 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 could you use event forwarding during the event as like a backup to your SIM if you needed the logs now or, if it takes too long to get out of, uh, you know, the information out of your SIM? Mm, maybe. I don't know. Maybe like a I second hope, set of eyes? I would hope all the logs are in your SIM and the SIM would be faster than setting up with. Yeah. The, True. The the rest, she goes on to say it has some nice features. It works with SCOM, SCOM, or SIM products as a complement. Uh, increases overall visibility in the environment. Uh, frequently, desktops aren't part of centralized monitoring due to licensing costs. Is that a, is that a true statement? Well, I mean, she obviously said it, and she's Jennifer Payne, so yes, it, it obviously is a true statement. But licensing costs for what? She says it's uh, centralized monitoring due to licensing costs. I guess you don't want to put a Splunk agent on every box, or uh, you know, a log agent. It doesn't agent. increase your license, though. Hmm. Do, do companies that do log monitoring and log collation, do they give you like a volume license? Like you can put this on all your desktops? Yeah, because usually it's it's based on throughput that's coming into the SIM. It's not based on um, how many agents how many, you know. how many endpoints. Like if you right. have 30 endpoints that barely log anything versus one that's logging the same amount, it's it, it's, it would be the same price. And, and all SIM agents license the same way like splunk it's not you know how many hosts it's how many terabytes of logs all you collect the today. ones that i know of are like that wow that's a nice racket it's a nice racket because really that's what the uh the uh, mssp is paying for in the end anyways like right. they don't care what's on your environment as long as they're getting the same you know the amount of logs or whatever right you know they're the ones that have to store all of that data and process all of that data. Right. So who cares where it comes from? Yeah. Well, here's something interesting. Okay. So windows event forwarding, uh, puts it in native as she says, EVTX, which is an XML log format. That would make it a lot easier to like, like grep through, wouldn't it? You could use like regular grepping tools or, or something like that instead of uh, having to, you know, make Splunk queries. So I could see that in an incident response being a lot quicker than having to, you know, remember, you know, what Splunk or what, what SQL query to use, right? Depends on the person. I'd rather I'd rather search through Splunk than remember what grep to use. Right. Oh, and Splunk <laughs> is not a sponsor of the show. We don't endorse them, so... <laughs> Just making sure. No, but it is one of my favorite tools. (laughs) It's just really expensive. Yeah, it's really freaking expensive. Like crazy expensive. Right. Right. Um, Yeah, it would be nice to get, maybe we should find a blog post about like somebody who's really used it because I I, I respect Miss Payne a lot, but uh, she's, you know, she works for the company that makes it, obviously. So she's not going to speak ill of it. Um, So I could could definitely see using the event forwarding for, you know, small organizations or if you've got it, your, your system's really, you know, locked down to where you're only logging what is necessary. Uh, you would definitely want to make sure that you're doing regular checks because as we've heard with the missing events, which I didn't know about until we started talking about it, that, um, you know, that you, you need to make sure you have a one-to-one copy for, for things like incident response. Yeah, I mean, one of my friends said, I'm pretty sure he said like it's eight to 10,000 endpoints that they use left on. That's a lot. Um, yeah. And, you know, um, are there any other? Uh, okay, so I don't want to say this weirdly. So, uh, <laughs> so there's a there's an event viewer and yeah. there's there's another log 
forwarding engine other than just the event viewer on Windows, right? There's actually like a built-in log correlation. You can, when, 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 or is this it? Is, is this, this something? Because This goes in, you can see show. it in event viewer. Yeah, you can look at stuff in PowerShell, but event viewer is what you're going to look at the EVTX files with. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, I haven't administered a Windows box in forever and a day, so... I'm trying to remember um, we used we used a log forwarder back back in around 2000 2003 but I thought it was Windows based and it was a part of the OS maybe that maybe they just renamed it and I didn't know so I mean I've seen like OS, uh, OSAC used um, an X log we just recently used WinLog beats gray log um, snare comes to mind was I tried out probably all of the possible options last week and now i have them all confused all in my head <laughs> yeah i'm trying to... to what does what correctly okay snare was snare was what we used back in the day i, th I thought it was okay. part of the actual yeah. windows but uh <sighs> snare was a, a audit log data and you could actually use snare to forward to to another sim okay so i'm yeah. thinking of something else okay my bad. Yep, and that's and that's what we're doing. We were uh, looking to forward WEF logs to a sim. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so when you when you set up your sim, do you have to set up a schema based on the XML files, or does it just take everything and and just drop it in? And in this case, there's transforms, and really there is for Splunk too. Okay. You, you like I can't remember what they're called because I never did that part. Um. But you basically say, all right, well, this is what the file looks like. And if it starts with user colon, it's going to be the user field in, in the sim. Or if it starts with, you know, user underscore name colon, it's also the same field. So you can yeah. correlate that stuff and it goes in all the same way into the sim. So the sim has to parse it somehow. And you need yeah. to tell it how to parse it. Yeah. And okay. Make sense of it. Okay. Oh, it's the Palantir. Okay. So yeah, there's I, other organizations. Um, I was actually just looking for more windows of importing stuff. There's companies like Palantir, which is a huge data warehousing type, you know, company that does all kinds of data collection. Um, and they have a guidance on windows of importing. I guess I need to put that link in the show notes now for that. Uh, so there were some questions I asked um, of our people before the before the show in our Slack channel about you know things that they would like to ask us about WEF and uh, one of the questions was any GPOs involved? Of course, yes, it can be used. It can be deployed with GPOs. Can it be done on a server by server basis? I think that was already answered. Yes, that it, it can be done on a server by server basis. Can an attacker simply disable the service once initial access is achieved? Um, they can. You should alert on that, though. Well, so, well, okay, so does, when they disable the service, the log file logs it but it wouldn't necessarily get sent to the sim then right yeah so you can you can log on uh if the event log was cleared right right um and then you can also set up a log saying oh i haven't seen logs from this device but i can still ping it right like you, you should set up something like that right especially if it's a dc or, or, or anything like that they That's may need elevated privileges in order to turn the log off like local admin Are they that the 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 way they got onto the box potentially and the elevation of privileges if if that was the case would have been logged and would be in the sim already the very last event would be to dis uh, disable the service okay that would yeah, be that the last probably gasp. would be logged would be forwarded and then the service would stop and you wouldn't get any more events in your sim but you'd still have local logs yeah, but, but the last thing you would see is there's been a signal SIG term for the, the service on, on the SIM, and then you wouldn't see anything after that point, or would you just see what was... Because I'm thinking of like a race condition kind of thing. If you shut off the service, do you get the fact that the service was shut off, sent to the SIM, or does the service get shut off and everything is now 
you know, blot or shut off from that point and everything's in the, in the, um, in the log I think file. there are several logs related to shutting off a service and you may get the first one, but not any subsequent ones. Right. I have yeah. to check. I'd have right. to double check. Okay. Uh, so director of InfoSec, one of our, one of our fine info, uh, slackers, uh, had asked the pros and cons of feeding the WEF output to a MapReduce system. And she says that MapReduce is basically a big data for long-term storage, lowering the signal to noise ratio. And she's just not sure what fidelity she's going to lose there versus going, throwing more storage at her SIM. So, um, I don't know if any of you have used MapReduce at all. Nope. Well, I'll have to ask her some more questions about that. For I haven't, <laughs> but but I can I can see the point of a data warehouse, right? And right. I think that's what that's what it is. Um, a data warehouse is just a, what a larger sim, basically. Like it's like sim. Or not sims. even a sim, just log aggregation. It's just log aggregation. Okay. I think, um, I think if you take a look at what logs you're actually forwarding and make sure you're forwarding the important ones and you probably don't need anything else to forward them directly to your data warehouse. Okay. They can go from the endpoints to the SIM and then from the SIM to the data warehouse. Oh, they don't have to go directly from the endpoints to the data warehouse. Well, what do you need a data warehouse for if you have a SIM? Does the data warehouse take all your various SIMs and all your various log correlation systems and go, okay, I only want what's important from your lo- your SIM for, for databasing and stuff? You may not need um, certain logs to exceed, for example, 90 days. Ah. Right, but you want to have stuff in order to go way back, like maybe logins, Right. So you can go back a year, Bob logged in here, or maybe application logs. Uh, or Yeah, or if you want something that you want to create a report on, but your storage for your SIM is faster and more expensive, so you want to send it somewhere else that you can maybe run like a monthly report on and you don't have to worry about it being on, you know, the fastest storage. Right. Okay. Okay. Maybe. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of guessing. <laughs> it, all, it all depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Right. Yeah. But I would, but I would caution not to send too much data any, not to send data. That's not really important. Right. Any, have it locally and maybe in case you happen to need it, but until you find a situation where you absolutely need it, um, I would hesitate to like, DNS logs locally, that's just a ton of data. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm scrolling up DNS through. Log, DNS logs have, anywhere is a ton of data. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if you don't have ad blockers. Can, can you imagine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely on a desktop. I was scrolling up through our hallway con on our Slack because that's where I put the, the question first. I'm having to scroll through pictures of 80s TV star Jan Michael Vincent uh, is topless. I don't know why that is, but that that's there. Um, <laughs> what? I don't. I don't know. Is it, have uh, director of InfoSec. All I, all I see is like Bruce Willis. Well, it's, it's above <laughs> Bruce Willis. Yeah. Okay. I was just trying to get all to all the questions. So uh, somebody else asked. Uh, not sure if they've used it, but WEF versus WinLog Beat versus NX Log. Miss Berlin, you said you had some knowledge about all this. Yeah, so the in in the case that I was doing, did it say WEF versus WinLog Beats? Yeah, versus yeah. NX Log. Okay, so in my case, we needed. Uh, so my customer already had WEF and a WEF environment set up, mm-hmm. right? But they wanted those logs to now forward to the uh, uh, sim. Mm-hmm. So you can't just say I want to send these WEF logs to the sim. You have to have an agent or something on that box. Okay. Um, so on the collector where all the event logs actually end up, uh, at first I was going to try and use NX log, but turns out, I don't know at what point this happened, but in their community edition, it doesn't have the correct files to be able to forward, uh, WEF logs. Uh-huh. Like it'll do everything else on that box. If it's on the, if it's an Asian on there, but it won't do the WEF logs unless you pay for it. Okay. Um, so we ended up going with WinLogBeats. 
okay. um, because it kind of just does the same thing. There was also a really cool tool that I tried to convince them to use that um, uh, SolarWinds has because it was way easier to set up because we wanted it like in uh, and um, syslog format. Right. Right. Um, and with WinLog Beats to get it in the format we needed, we also needed Logstash to do like a transform. Yeah. So it was an additional step. But this uh, um, this tool from SolarWinds was super simple. It was like a two two button setup. It was all a GUI. It just opened it up and said, "Oh, look, here's everything that is listed in your event viewer. Which ones do you want us to forward and where?" Right. And okay. I thought that was probably the easiest way that I've ever seen that you can forward events to. But it's Solar Winds, so I'm assuming but it wasn't free. Solar Winds. It is a free tool. Oh. It's just uh, business reasons why we didn't use that one. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's free, and they they try to get you to buy the pro version, which I think is like what four thousand. Probably super. That's expensive. not bad considering it's a log tool. So you know. Um, cool. Uh -huh. All right. So one of the last things, so need a config, get some examples here for, uh, NX log, win log beat, file beat, windows logging service and other stuff. Oh, well, there's, there's an ad there. I didn't finish looking at the URL. So yes. Why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about the URL there, Mr. Betcher? Okay. So Michael has, um, done a lot of research on the different, um, log forwarding, tools uh -huh. and he's got some sample configs for these types when log beat is in there nx log file beat um there's also windows logging service which is really good it's an alternative to the splunk forwarder okay so if you uh, look at that wait um uh, wait there are configs out there i'm sorry you said windows logging service and yep okay so how's that different from windows event forwarder Windows logging service is different. It was um, created by a guy who worked for the government and the government um, won't install certain software that they can't actually do a code audit on. Right. So if the company says, well, this is proprietary, we can't give out the code. Then they say, okay, well, we can't buy your product. Okay. Right? So um, Jason McCord, uh, created this tool and uh, it's available. Okay. So just, I, I thought this was service. I thought this it's was a, another thing that came with, with windows, but it's a, it's a third party tool. That's right. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, I, well, I mean, does anybody have any other thoughts or suggestions about WEF, uh, you know, using it? There's some, there's some pros and cons. It does tend to apparently to lose some events, but you know, uh, are so my my question is are the events that it loses important and you know if they're not important you know is it okay to take the risk of using it it all depends and me I mean, personally i don't think i could live with myself if if there <laughs> maybe some events that are not going to get there right yeah i like the guarantee um of of that you know, if it's if something is logged, then it's going to end up in the sim. I'm going to know it. It's 100% right. guaranteed. I'm not going to have to go. But well, well, you know, I searched for that and it's not there. But maybe it's stored locally. It just didn't get forward. You well, know, me, I don't want to have to try and ask myself those questions. Let me ask you something. All right, so you're you're saying that that WEF, you know, is missing events. When was the last time you actually checked the veracity of the local logs versus your sim logs? I mean, with your me? with your existing solution, because maybe it's missing events that you you didn't know you were missing. Mm, I never, I never had to. Like, wait, I, I don't know have access. Happened. But I'm yeah, hearing a lot of you don't even all I'm access. hearing is a lot of excuses. I'm not hearing <laughs> <laughs> hearing a lot of quitter talk here. <laughs> so you you guys have, you, you guys have how never would you even do that other than spot checking. Well, I mean, maybe you should spot like, check. It's two completely different formats, and like, I, I guess you could grab through the EVTX, but then you also have to like, I. It's not like you could do a diff. Yeah. 
right? Right. So it it, it appears that uh, WEF is not alone in missing events. I'm seeing a company called McAfee here with redundant enterprise security manager is missing events from May 16, 2016. I'm seeing, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, McAfee support community. I'm seeing Cisco IPS data source missing in SIM events. Uh, so maybe WEF isn't the only, you know, WEF or, you know, logging system that's missing events. It's just the one that you guys know of. So maybe, maybe you people out there uh, that are, you know, SIM analysts and, you know, making sure everything's being logged, maybe you're missing events that you don't know. Maybe you should, you know, get with your SIM folks and go, Maybe we need to do a spot check. That could be very helpful. That is what, a really good idea. What are you missing? So there's some there's some definite hygiene right there. Maybe you should go in tomorrow and go, yeah, exactly. Should this work? What am I missing? Sim policy. Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe you'll find out you actually have missed something that you didn't realize you had. And maybe it's just good to I go. I guess you could go based on count. Really? Like, uh, events from coming from a specific device, you know, say you, say you get all your security and system events from a windows device, right. You know, look from, you know, noon to midnight on a day and see if the numbers match up mm -hmm. on, on total events. Okay. Cause that would, that would give you a good idea. All right. I'm actually doing a Google search for missing events, Splunk and seeing what we come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not trying to be mean against Splunk, but you know, it's oh, missing events, topics, Splunk answers, missing of events and flooding of data in heavy forwarder, how to search losing events as number of events increase, how to troubleshoot why I'm missing events in my search events, answers.splunk.com. Yeah, okay. So there's some basic hygiene that, that blue teamers need to do. You need to find out if your sim's missing anything. Uh and the problem is it's going to be a nightmare to look through that, especially if you're getting several thousand events, you know? So there you go. So I apologize to, you know, bagging on WEF because it appears that every SIM user, sucks. every <laughs> SIM, uh, yeah, every SIM product is missing events at some point or another. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, now I feel better because, uh, you know, if I'd have told my wife about that shit, she'd probably gotten me. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure. What's that? But what? that these forwarders are missing events. Do you think it might not be some sure. layer eight issues? No. Huh? You think it might be layer eight <laughs> issues? It could be. Could be layer eight. That tends to sneak up. Remember that one guy we interviewed and, and there were eight layers? Right. I didn't I didn't know that. So there he, he told me something I didn't know. Right. There are. Anyway. So yes, um maybe maybe go in tomorrow and talk to your sim folks and find out if there's a way you can easily check, you know, versus the locals. You know, can you know maybe maybe you can, you know, you can send your Splunk forwarder to more than one place on your system, so maybe you can pair that off and, you know, check a DC or check a workstation on a smaller SIM or a smaller version of the Splunk, and then, you know, maybe do a comparison one for one to see if you're missing anything. That way you're not, you know, trying to sift through thousands of, uh, of events. So that, that may be something. <clears throat> anyway... Uh, I don't have anything else. Uh, I do want to have Ms. Berlin mention some of the things that are going on at Derby. Uh, she's going to be a very busy lady there. So. <laughs> yeah, I've been a really busy <laughs> lady. Like af uh, As soon as I'm done with work, I've been working all night on this mental health stuff. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, they gave us a uh, – DerbyCon gave us a URL. So you can go to derbycon.com slash wellness, and it takes your – my janky little – google doc <laughs> nice. as opposed to a website yep. but i think that the couple things that i'm super super excited about is i i just paid for um the chair massages cool so saturday from nine to five we will have four massage therapists there oh uh, i thought and, i didn't know why you were wanting massage chairs all day no, so no, that's no, weird just, but okay yeah, yeah chair massages from nine to five and first come first serve yep um you know just show up and it's like 
they said 10 to 15 minutes per person, depending on if there's a line or whatever. Cool. Um, and then the other thing I'm really excited about is um, there, uh, this lady named Susan. She is a yoga instructor, and she's also going to Derby. So she's an infosec. Cool. And she has like something like 700 hours of yoga under her belt. And okay. she's going to be leading yoga and meditation both Friday and Saturday morning for an hour. Oh, nice. From eight to nine. Okay. Yeah. So there's that. And then Catherine Smith is going to do some chair yoga. So for the people that like sit in chairs all day and, you know, different stretches and stuff that you can do in your chair. That's important. Um, I'll tell you, because my office chair, is. I, you know, I've got some like back issues. And if you don't, oh yeah, you know, if you're, if you're sitting all day, you know, sometimes having a standing desk is just helpful, but you know, I can't stand at my desk all day with my standing desk. So I do have a chair that I sit down with. Yeah. Yep. Having, moving around just, you know, is helpful, especially if you're sitting here and popping shells all day. It, it, you know, oh, yeah. it, it does take a toll yeah, on and- your body. And, and for, for the chair one, it's obviously just going to be in the room and you grab a chair and you pull up and, and do whatever. Cool. For the yoga in the morning, um, I'm going to be pro- I, I'm gonna pro- be providing 20 yoga mats. I don't know if there will be 20 people coming or if there will be more than that. Yeah. So if you don't have one, I'll have them for you. Cool. Um, and just a whole bunch of other stuff. Like the schedule is almost full. Wow. We have... Uh, Jason Street said he's going to lead a discussion nice. and um, yeah, we just have like a large amount of people helping and I'm super happy with all the volunteers and everything. Yep. It's yeah. It's going to be um, fantastic. You know, take, take, take some time off from the over overly technical stuff and uh, you know, clear your calendar to go, go hear J Street talk. Cause uh, I, I saw his uh, keynote at, forget which one it was Gurkhan or something on it's on youtube but it it was one of them ones it was like you need to listen to it because there's mm-hmm. a lot of stuff going on in the industry and he was talking about issues in the industry but it made me oh, uncomfortable from Sky Dog which one that was from sky dog con sky dog con yes that's what it was yeah. yeah i i was uncomfortable listening to it but it was definitely something that should be should be heard or should be listened to i'm sure he's not talking about what he did at sky dog con but um He's, you know, he's, he's gone through a few things in his life and uh, you definitely want to, you know, clear your calendar if you can get to hear him speak. And, and a lot of these things are just good, are just discussion groups. Like I had to split it out in between people that are actually talking and giving a presentation Mm -hmm. and the discussion groups where it's really just, you show up and there's like kind of a moderator that might have handouts or might just have discussion points to talk about. You know, they kind of start off with why they wanted to lead the discussion group and um yeah there's probably 10 of those i think nice um and i and i have like a crap ton of stuff like i keep on getting everything that i ordered from amazon i think (laughs) my my uh ups and postal guy probably hate me at this point (laughs) it's okay Sorry. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I know Mr. Mr. Betcher uh, and Mr. Goff got us a table this year, which is awesome. Uh, we'll be sitting at it, uh, kind of helping discuss, you know, some of the, the, the log MD stuff. stuff. And there'll be some, we'll definitely be talking about the log MD stuff. Uh, but you know, we'll also be there for some of the podcast stuff as well. If you want to come by and say, Hey, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a booth, uh, a booth person, uh, I'm going to have more knowledge, I think, about LogMD than than I would expect to have because I want to be able to speak intelligently to it if somebody asks questions. So, um, so is there anything else, uh, Mr. Betcher, you'd like to mention about DerbyCon before we go? Yeah, Amanda, I noticed you're going to have a fidget table. A what? Yeah. A what now? That's cool. Now, we're going to bring some LogMD little fidget things as well. So Sweet. Oh. We can put some of those at the table. Yeah. yeah I got uh, a whole bunch of different, like, not just fidget cubes, but just, like, Ooh, I got putty cube. and sand and, like, Zen Gardens and just everything that I could find that they sold on Amazon that you could possibly fidget with. You're and talking, then, like, stuff um, for tactile have- sensations. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I have another table that's going to be um, like adult coloring books. And uh, what else do I have? Oh, like 
a couple of the things are that are kind of expensive that you don't know if you want to spend the money on, but you might want to try them. So there's like right. the vita- I think it's like the vitamin D happy lights that like simulate sunlight. Okay. Hmm. Um, they like help against seasonal depression. Right. Right. Yep. Um, yep. and then weighted blankets. Like I bought a, a weighted blanket, which I hear uh, can help people like during anxiety attacks and depression. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, stuff like that, that you don't know if you've, if, if you want to buy or not, you can come and try it out. Yep. It might, so might if you, go ahead. It might, uh, you know, all these things are very interesting. If you've never tried yoga before, that might be helpful to, to learn how to try, especially if you're trying to find something that's, uh, is it low impact? Oh yeah, totally. So, and it, and it's, know, it's totally going to be like beginner's yoga too. So right. if you can't stand on one foot, don't worry about it. Just like come. And uh, I found that every yoga thing that I've ever done, it's just like do whatever works for you. And there's always like different, different things that you can do if you're not as flexible or if you have an injury or anything like that, like right. just come to it. Like yep. it, it should, you should learn either way and you know there's there's other different types and the thing is though you may get sweaty so you'll want to go and take a shower afterwards so please go take a shower afterwards uh if you you know are are planning on doing that stuff Uh, plan on having to go take a shower so if you're if you're in the marriott or the omni or the 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 hilton that's you know that's going to be kind of compulsory. Wear, wear some comfy clothes wear yes wear something stretchy don't try to come in a mini skirt and try to do yoga Nobody wants to see that. Oh, wait. Uh, or you tell a kilt, Zach. <laughs> Don't try to do you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> come on. If he shows up to yoga and you tell a kilt, you're in trouble. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to make sure he shows up. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, holy cow. We're way over on our time. So, Miss um, Berlin, Mr. Betcher, how would uh, I'm going to start with Miss Berlin. How would people get a hold of you if they wanted to talk about things at DerbyCon or, um, you know, anything else in particular about WEF or logging? Uh, so on Twitter at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. Right on. Mr. Betcher, same thing. Yeah, if you don't know what logs are important, like you listen to this conversation and you don't know what you should be forwarding, well, I wrote a tool that can help you with that. It basically tells you how to configure your Windows logs and uh, um, what logs are important as far as catching the bad guys, right? Right. So um, it's free. It's on log-md.com. Check it out. Right on. And uh, you're at BetcherPwned on Twitter. Yes, I am. B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. Uh, you can follow the the podcast at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. Uh you can follow me on at Brian Brake B R Y A N B R A K E. Had a ton of new followers uh, to the to the BreakSec podcast. Uh, if you are here because you were doing the DerbyCon thing, uh, we still have the charity auction, which is going to happen on the seventh of September at. Uh, um, I forget. I'll have to look at next or last week's uh, notes, but we'll have some more announcements on Twitter about that and on our Slack channel, which is. Uh, um, you can, you know, join us on our Slack if you'd like by sending us a DM to BreakSec, or you can email bds.podcast at gmail.com. And yeah, we'll be doing it on the Slack like we did last year. We'll just set up a special channel. Uh, bids will happen in there. Opening bid will be 175 bucks, which is the face value of the ticket. Uh, bid increments will be in $25 increments. And uh, whoever is the last bidder after like 6 o'clock p.m. Pacific on that night will get the ticket. Um, so, yeah, if you are still looking for a ticket and you want to donate to a good cause, which is the Rural Technology Fund, which is Chris Sanders' organization, helping uh, disadvantaged uh organizations and schools uh, get technology so uh, 175 bucks is gonna give them a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of you know cash to work with so um, looking forward to helping him out with that and as a matter of fact um, I will probably match up to 250 bucks if if it gets that high so I will also donate another 250 up to 100 250 if that's uh, if that happens so that's what's gonna happen <clears throat> Anyway, so um, 
follow us on iTunes, our, our I, Apple Podcasts, leave feedback. That helps us get discovered by more people. Uh, there are still people out there, surprisingly, who've never heard of us. I know. Weird, huh? What? I know. Um, so we're on Spotify, uh, www.breakingsecurity.com, B-R-A-K-I-N-G Security, and you can find out where we're at all over in our show notes. We're in Spotify, uh, TuneIn Radio app, iHeartRadio. There's pretty much nowhere you can't find us. And uh, also, thank you to our patrons. We appreciate you. Uh, the money you give us every month goes to, to hosting and equipment upgrades and uh, allows us to, you know, do things to, to make the podcast better for you. So we appreciate you helping out. Um, DerbyCon's our Super Bowl. Seriously, I know people are probably like, oh my god, I wish you didn't stop talking about DerbyCon. This is really like our Super Bowl. That's that's our one time a year where we get to like do stuff. I don't get to go to a ton of conferences, so and I know Mr. Betcher doesn't either. So Miss Berlin, she's she's Miss Popular. Everywhere. We're just happy to be basking in the glow of Berlining down oh, security. Oh, I guess I'm keynoting at uh, Three Rivers Infosec, I think it's called. Three Rivers Infosec. Pittsburgh? Yes. I knew that because Three Rivers Stadium used to be where they used to play. The Steelers used to play at Three Rivers Stadium. So. Yes. So I'm speaking there. Right. Okay. Very cool. Sometime in October. Wow. Boy, you're just going right from Derby to keynoting somewhere else. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well. Uh, I don't have anything else. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please feel free to email us or hit us up on Twitter. So that was it for Breaking Down Security this week. Have a great week. Uh, hope to have a very important speaker and very awesome author next week. Woo! I don't want to jinx it, so I'm not going to say anything. You already jinxed it. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the podcast every week. What are you talking about? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Wowzers. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, no. Oh, okay. Yes. There's we'll the book. Sign this book. Thank you. Betcher's got the book. Defensive Security Handbook. Go buy it in O'Reilly. So, uh, have a great week. Be nice to one another. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye bye. And we're done. Oh, my goodness with you people. <laughs> oh, I'm already on the show. Oh, it's Arthur. I'm an author. <laughs> That's just despicable. How long did we go? That was a good conversation. Uh, yeah. And I, uh, I like we, went, that one. we went roughly well, over an hour. Over an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was, I didn't actually know about the, uh, the additional things, but yeah, it seems like everybody's got issues with missing events. So, I mean, maybe that's a systemic thing, you know, maybe they, yeah. uh, people don't realize that they're missing things and that could hurt them in the long run if they're I doing. I can't believe a customer's never asked. Well, they don't know to, ask. they don't know to ask. It's one of them unknown like, are unknowns. Are you sure you're getting all of our logs? Like, how do you know you're. You're not missing any. Well, you know, we had who? Kevin Johnson and Nick Selby on during that whole MSSP debacle. Remember okay. the the people completely got owned and they went to their that was before yeah, me, I think. They went to their MSSP and they didn't have anything. And so oh, I mean shit. companies yeah, that's don't because ask. they weren't even sniffing the right traffic. Right. Right. Yep. So, I mean, that goes back we to customers asking their MSSP for, you know, what are they logging? Are they logging yeah, things? You we know? have a problem with that sometimes. Like, our customers will get pissed because we don't see something. But they, like, oh, you never told us you had this network. Right. Like, how, how are we supposed to know that you need an IPS there if we didn't even know the network was there? Right. That happens. That happens.